Hello, I'm Tom Martin from the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'm joined today with Blood Cancers Today Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Sagar Loniel of the Winship Cancer Institute in Emory, Dr. Shambhavi Richard of the Center of Excellence for Multiple Myeloma in the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, and Dr. Peter Voorhees of Levine Cancer Institute in North Carolina. And this is our first roundtable of um, discussion on BCMA-targeted CAR T-cell therapy. Um, and I want to um, kind of go to where um, where we think the space where CAR T-cell is going to be the best, but, but also really about choosing the correct patient for CAR T-cell therapy. So right now we have the availability of CARs for late line therapy, patients who've had four or more prior lines of therapy. So when you guys think about who's the, who's the patient you're going to select for to go forward with CAR T-cell therapy, what are the caveats of that? And, and what are the characteristics of that patient population that you move forward with? P Peter, how, how do you choose your patients at, um, in North Carolina? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the first question is, you know, when should, you know, people start thinking about CAR T-cell therapy? And if they're not being treated by, you know, our institution, you know, when should regional providers, you know, refer their patients for CAR T-cell therapy? And at least with the existing regulatory approvals, I would say as soon as you start fourth line therapy, you know, you get them to, to see us right at that point. And if they respond to that fourth line therapy, that's great. You know, they've had four prior lines of therapy. They've got good disease control going into apheresis. You've got something that you can bridge them with. So as soon as you start fourth line therapy, it, it's time to go um, because that fourth line therapy is not going to produce a durable response in the overwhelming majority of cases. So that's when the patient should be considered. That's when the patient should be uh, referred. And I think that the backlog uh, of apheresis slots has gotten a bit better as manufacturing capacity has increased somewhat. We all have clinical trials, you know, with bispecifics and CAR T cell therapies. And then we have commercial approval of teclistimab, uh, the first BCMA bispecific antibody. So all of that. I think has alleviated some of this backlog at a lot of our centers. So patients can get in and get East a bit faster. You know, we still have progress to be made on that front, but we're doing better now than we were before. Um, interestingly, when we did the, the real world uh, analysis of uh, IDACEL, 75% of the patients that were uh, uh, reported on uh, were not eligible uh, for the KARMA trial. And there were kind of four big buckets, you know, why that was the case. One was uh, prior BCMA-targeted therapy. Um, so there was a cohort of patients that had prior BCMA-targeted therapy. Uh, renal dysfunction was another one. Uh, cytopenias was another one. And then an ECOG performance status of two. So in spite of the fact that three quarters of the patient in this real world experience would not have been eligible for the initial you know, phase two KARMA trial, we had very good overall response identical progression-free survival, very similar CRS and ICANS rates. Um, so I, I guess what I would say is, you know, you um, can be somewhat flexible. I would argue that a, a frail patient probably is not a good patient uh, for CAR T-cell therapy. I think you've got to be very careful with patients who have pre-existing cytopenias and a large burden of disease going into CAR T-cell therapy. If you don't have a pool of stem cells to boost them on the outback uh, of things, you know the, the, they can experience very prolonged cytopenias that can be quite uh, uh, problematic. Um, there was a signal towards um, inferior progression-free survival for those patients that had an ECOG performance status of two in the real world experience. So again, you know, if a patient is frail, I'm probably thinking about commercial teclistimab uh, over a CAR T cell uh, product. Um, we're starting to get um, more experience um, doing CAR T-cell therapy in patients with renal impairment. I think for folks that have creatinine clearances of 30 mils per minute or better, um, very comfortable in that situation. We're starting to get anecdotal experience in dialysis-dependent patients, and as long as you modify the fludarabine appropriately, it can be done, but you've got to be really careful about who you're selecting in that circumstance.
Yeah, we, we have also, we've told our local docs, please start counting lines of therapy because it's it's very important these days. And and we're a little slower in California in general. So we tell them to try to get them to us, maybe even when they start their third line of therapy mm -hmm. so that we can see them. So you, I love the thought that you put in their fourth line, if they're responding to fourth line therapy, that you then take them to CAR T cell while they're responding to their fourth line. Is that is that what I heard? Yes. Which is great. And then when you choose a regimen for the fourth line, are there any drugs that you would tell the local doc to avoid prior to the collection of, of CAR T cells? Yeah, I think anything that's rough on T cells is something that you need to avoid. Um, I, I know that we use bendamustine based therapies. Uh, uh, Dr. Lonial's uh, favorite agent uh, for treatment of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, but bendamustine is sometimes used, but that's very harsh on T cells. In fact, it is an alternate lymphodepletion uh, regimen for, for CAR T cell therapy. So avoiding bendamustine based therapies Avoiding alkylator-based uh, therapies in general, you know, I think PACE-based, DCEP-based uh, infusional therapies, you know, could potentially pose problems at the time of apheresis. Now, you know, just given the space in which these agents are currently approved, sometimes we have no choice, right? And we have to use these things because there's really nothing else to offer the patient to get them to apheresis. But if you're in a circumstance where you can avoid it, um, I would absolutely avoid it.